Father, I thank you again for your word. Reading of your word is always wonderful. It's nice, good to hear. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement in your word. I pray, Lord, as we study this story and we'll learn the lessons from it, I will give heed unto them, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning is The Seven Abominations Part 2. The Seven Abominations Part 2. I'll take you back to Proverbs chapter 6. You can open to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. Let's read the abominations. The seven abominations. These six things, Proverbs 6, 16. These six things that the Lord hate. Yes, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devised wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So we, we've already looked at three of them last week, and I want to remind us, abomination means something hated, but not just normally hated, but hated with a higher degree. So it's a higher degree of hatred. Abomination is from the word abhor. To abhor something, something is disgusting to you, detestable to you, is vile to you. So that is what abomination means. So we looked at a proud look, just having that swagger, right? Uh, a, a proud look, a lying tongue, and feet that be swift in running to mischief. So we looked at all that last week. I'm just going to go ahead because we have a lot to cover. Let's look at the fourth one. Hands that shed innocent blood. So what are hands that shed innocent blood? Now, shedding blood or killing in of itself is not evil. It's, I mean, it's not, not that it's not evil. It's not a sin. Because not all evil is sin. So it's not a sin. Because remember, what is the government? They're supposed to be ministers. They're holding the sword not in vain. So if they're killing someone, it doesn't mean they're sinning because they're doing the, the work of God. So who are they supposed to kill? Those that God, those are worthy of death according to the Bible, right? I won't go into that. But so, um, or how about the guy that is avenging blood, the avenger of the blood? So if he finds a person that killed his loved one outside of the house of refuge, because you might not know what I'm talking about, but in the laws of Moses, God said if someone kills someone by mistake, he runs to the house of refuge or to a city of refuge, and the judges will look at it and find out that, okay, it was by mistake, he had no evil intent, and if... He's, he has to stay in that city of refuge until the high priest dies, then he's free. But if that guy is found outside the city of refuge, the avenger of blood, whether it's the husband of the wife he killed, or a friend, or the brother, or the father, the avenger of blood has the right to kill him if he's outside the city of refuge. You understand? So, at that point, you're not going to say, oh, he sinned, because it's covered under the laws of Moses. What I'm trying to say is, not all shedding of blood is sin. Oh, this is sin, this is sin. It's not all sin. It's, it's the context. Is it innocent blood? Now, if it is innocent blood, that is sin. And God clearly says it here, hands that shed innocent blood. I mean, David shed uh, a lot of blood, some of which were innocent blood. But David shed a lot of blood. And um, I don't think God just wants us to be shedding blood. I don't think that's, that's utopia. You know, that was not how it was in the days of Solomon, uh, where it's just a bunch of shedding of blood. In fact, that's why God did not let David to build him a temple, build him a house, because his hands were full of blood. Um, so shedding innocent blood is always sin, and that's killing the innocent. And you say innocent, but none of us are innocent. So anybody that you shed their blood, oh yeah, they deserve to die, right? No, but it's innocent in context. Why did you shed the blood? There are if someone steals, it doesn't mean you kill the person, right? There's God's own judgment. You only the, the judgment of killing, capital punishment is reserved for those according to what the word of God says. So innocent in that context. Now, when I think about shedding innocent blood, the first thing that comes to my mind while I was writing this sermon, first thing that came to my mind was abortion. I mean, you can't get any more innocent than a day-old child. And people kill day-old children. In fact, an hour, a second-old child, right? There's this abortion that is done the night after. Something like that is called like the day after or the night after or something like that. You take a pill, and that is abortion. The night after the event. So, 
uh, it's still abortion it, uh, it, 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 and that's what America is full of right whether the child is viable or the child is not viable you know that's the argument oh when is the child viable uh, who determines when the child is viable and that's the, is it the doctor that determines when the child is viable or the parent or their situation what is viable the question I have for these guys are comparing or arguing about what is viable and what is not viable. If someone has been looking for a child for 60 years, right, and the person gets pregnant and the person is trying to have a child and the doctor comes and says, I don't think this child is viable. What do you think that person is going to say? I don't care what I give birth to, whether it's a lizard that comes out, I'm having my child, right? I mean, so it's not about viable or is that they don't understand the gift of God. They don't understand the fruit of the womb. They don't understand that. And therefore, they're killing innocent souls. Innocent souls. So many believers are guilty of this. And, and, and that's something I want to point out. In this list of seven abominations, these are things that believers are guilty of. I'm not just talking about what sinners are guilty of. Or what unbelievers, I should say. Because we're all sinners, right? I'm not talking about what un unbelievers are guilty of. Or wicked people. And I, No, I'm warning you that you should not get into these things. Uh, because as believers, you could fall into this trap and become abhorred by God. God is warning us. The wise man is telling you these things, these six things God hates. Yes, seven, an abomination to him. So we should be very careful about these things. Men of God in the Bible are guilty of this. Open to Acts chapter 22. Shedding innocent blood. King David shed innocent blood. King Saul shed innocent blood. I mean, he went to the priest and told, told his men, kill all the priests. Wow. And you know that Edomite killed all the priests. I can't remember his name. But, uh, but that was Saul's command. So Saul, guilty of shedding innocent blood. Joab, guilty of shedding innocent blood. Even Paul. You're there in Acts chapter 22. Acts, I mean, I could give you all these examples, but... Um, I hope we know these stories. David, he shed the innocent blood of Uriah, his, um, his servant, very loyal friend to uh, King Saul. I explained that. Joab, uh, a brother in battle. It was in the time of peace when he shed the innocent blood. And, um, okay, Paul. Let's look at Paul. Uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 20. The Bible says, And when the blood of thy martyr, Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the, the raiment of them that slew him. Open to Matthew chapter 5. So you say, oh, but I might not have physically shed innocent blood. I did, I did not kill anybody. I didn't physically kill anybody. But being an accomplice means that you're guilty of it. If you're part and parcel, if you're part of the reason why this person died, it means you are guilty of it. The Bible says, open to Matthew chapter 5, in Romans chapter 1 verse 32, the Bible says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So when you even having pleasure in them that do them, it's the same punishment. You're part of them. That's what the Bible says. So, and that includes shedding innocent blood. You say, oh, what's your business with somebody, uh, abortion, and what's your business with all of that? First of all, it affects me, if you go down the line, because that's my cousin to, that's, you know, we're all same blood, right? Noah. Second of all, it affects the society, my children, it affects different things. But um, I cannot pleasure in them, I cannot approve them. How did it start? How did this messed up sodomy agenda and all these things start? Confusion. It started off with, just let us be. Let us be. So they let them be. Now it started off with, uh, it went on to, oh, let us get married. They let them get married and now uh, approve of us. So it was tolerate us before, now it's approve us. You cannot just say, you're on your own, I don't, I don't approve of it, but I'm going to let you be. That is not enough for them. When you see them passing, you have to clap for them. You have to say, yes, that is the right way. We are wrong. We were so wrong. All the forefathers were wrong. You are the best people. Hey, put a red carpet for you guys. You, this is the future. This is what we should be doing. That's what they want. Anybody, I mean, they're giving them awards just for, you know, being cockroaches you know coming out of the closet so it's 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 sad and um, what I was trying to say here open Matthew chapter 5 so being an accomplice uh, of, of shedding innocent blood makes you guilty of it too and that's what Jesus is warning, uh, warning us in the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 I'll give you an example verse 21 he says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Right? In danger of the judgment. Look at the next verse. 
But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Is that not the same thing with thou shalt not kill? If you kill, you're in danger of the judgment. Hey, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. You see that? You say, oh, but I've not killed anybody. I've not. But God is saying it's the same thing. You're angry without a cause. Why are you angry with your brother? Yeah, without a cause, you are in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So, being angry without a cause is comparable to killing. And that's what Jesus is warning us. Oh, I'm not shedding the same blood. Uh, but you might have been an accomplice to it, just like Paul was in the death of Stephen. Look at 2 Kings chapter 21. Back to our Bible reading. 2 Kings 21, verse 16. 2 Kings 21, verse 16. It is one of the significant sins that caused God not to uh, repent from destroying Judah. In 2 Kings 21, 16, the, oh sorry, this is not a Bible, a Bible is 1 Kings. I was wondering, 1 <laughs> Kings. But this is 2 Kings 21, 16. Bible says, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, to another, beside his sin, wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So Manasseh did so much abominations and so many evils and uh, worshipping idols and all of that, sacrificing children to Molech. But he said, in, the Bible makes it very clear that in addition, he shed so much innocent blood that it could fill one end of the city to the other. And you see why in the end times or the wrath of God, the blood of the city, you know, in the wine press that Jesus is going to do, would reach the horse's bridle, right? City flowing, eight furlongs. Oh, sorry, is it more than that? Maybe more than that. Um, so, what is saying here, Manasseh shed so much innocent blood and that caused God not to repent from destroying Judah because God really hated it. In 2 Kings chapter 23, open to 2 Kings chapter 23, 2 Kings 23 from verse 21. 2 Kings 23, 21. The Bible says, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel, nor in the days, nor in the kings, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holding, to the Lord in Jerusalem. So first off, we can see that the Israel is coming, sorry, Judah is coming back to God. I mean, they are worshiping God. They did a great Passover, greatest Passover held ever, right? I mean, it wasn't in the days of judges, that's after the law was given and they moved into their land. No Passover was held like that. All the days of the kings of Israel, the days of uh, uh, kings of Judah, no Passover was held like this. So they've come back to God, they've done great sacrifice. I mean, God is happy with them. Let's keep reading verse 24. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and wizards and the images and idols and all the abominations which that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away, that he might perform the words of the law which, was, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like, and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him rose there any like him. Greatest king that turned to the Lord. See that? Verse 26. Notwithstanding. If you are in Pentecostal church, everybody say notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. Okay, I'm just kidding. Alright. So verse 26. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah. Why? Because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. So because of what Manasseh did, the shedding of innocent blood, all the abominations, all those things, and God specifically points out the shedding of innocent blood. So, shedding of innocent blood is something God really hates. And you can be part of it and not necessarily commit that sin itself. So, let's be warned. And that's what Jesus is, is telling us. You're angry with your brother without a cause. 
then it's like murder, and that's innocent blood. Let's look at the, second, the next one, number five of the abominations, and heart that devised wicked imaginations. Open to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And heart that devised wicked imaginations. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 3. Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So, you have to cast down. That's, this is the battle we're fighting too, right? You, you, the weapons you have is for, to cast down imaginations. And you can apply that, you know, idols, setting up things in your mind above the Lord. And, um, and cast down every, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bring into captivity every thought. So, you're thinking of ways to do something. You're thinking of inventions. Hey, it should be according to the obedience of Christ. Under the obedience of Christ, right? Anything you're thinking of, it has to be fine with God. So, we are under the law to Christ. We have to remember that. So, having a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Bringing up ideas uh, that will lead people to sin. That is wicked. Wicked is a higher degree of ungodliness. So it's not just that you're ungodly, but you're to a higher degree. That's why God hates it. It's an abomination to him. When you have a heart that is devising wicked imaginations. So various sins fall under this cat uh, uh, category. Let's look at some examples. Open to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 25. King David devised a way to murder his friend and a loyal servant, Uriah. Remember that? So that is a heart that is devising wicked imaginations. He devised a way. Oh, put him in the front of the line. And, you know, because he will be killed in the front of the line. So he used him as a pawn. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Look at verse 14 and 15. Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Siah, and set them up to be his gods, and bowed down himself before them, and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? I mean, this guy... I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how foolish she is, but the more I think about it, I'm like, that is what many people are doing. It's just like looking at Israelites and saying, oh, I want to go back to Egypt. You're like, how foolish can you be? But that is what believers do. That is what people still do. Um, this king goes with the help of God. He destroys the Edomites, and he now takes their gods. And he's worshiping their gods. He sets up their. He has this idea of all oh, that. Let's worship their gods since we're in their land. You know, when in Rome, you know, do as the Romans. So that's what he's doing, and that is wrong. That is having an evil imagination. You put something above God, and that is wicked. So he devised a way to be wicked. I mean, God really hated. His anger was kindled. Remember, these are the things that God hates: abominations. Look at King Jeroboam. Wow, King Jeroboam, God told him he's going to be a king, he's going to bless him, he's going to keep him, he, his kingdom is going to stand. God gave him all of that, saved him from Solomon, someone was looking to kill him, saved him from Solomon, and as soon as he becomes king, what does he do? He said, these be the gods that brought you out of Egypt. I mean, and he said, he brought up people to be priests. This was a man that was a good man, right? I mean, saved, I believe, I think he was saved. A, a great man and God picked him and this is what he did you have a heart because you're afraid of something you don't believe in the word of God because clearly King Jeroboam did not believe in the word of God and so he led all of Israel to worship false gods and Molech and Baal and, and that, that was a bad heart that devised evil imaginations now, when you remember Romans chapter 1, remember the list of unrighteousness? You remember one of them says, the inventors of evil things. 
things like um, uh, evil things you see in, uh, on websites. You know, internet is good. YouTube is good. Uh, you know, go, be able to go to websites and get information. And Google is good. But people use that evil things. They, you know, they they put so much evil in there that harms the young people and people that are naive and people that don't know. Um, and misleads their life. So this, that's another way inventors of evil things. And this is abusing the gift of choice and creativity. When God gives us the ability to invent things, to make our lives better, people abuse it. And God hates that. So you're abusing that gift of choice, the gift of creativity that God has given us. So instead of thinking of ways to cheat in the test, right? You know, there's some people that they spend all their time, instead of studying for the test, they spend all their time thinking of how they're going to cheat in the test. And they come up with very elaborate plans. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to confess my fault. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> they come up with very elaborate plans. How they'll cheat, where they'll hide the questions. You know, they go to the bathroom or something. You know, instead of studying for the test. And they're so smart. It's, it's amazing. Uh, open to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. In fact, I'll quote it for you. The Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So, but when you have a heart that devises evil imaginations, God hates that. Because He wants you to keep your heart with all diligence. Because the issues of life come out of your heart. Now, let's move on. Number six. Number six. Lesson. A false witness that speaketh lies. A false witness that speaketh lies. I, I myself, I hate this. So, I mean, I hate everything God hates, but, you know, I hate this one too. This is very bad. How, how you say you're a witness, but you're speaking lies? You're a false witness. It, it, God is just trying to emphasize. A false witness, that speaketh lies. God... <laughs> This destroys judgment and justice. And please read your Bible. You will see everywhere God is looking for judgment. He's looking for justice. In fact, let's read some of the Bible verses. There are just a lot of them. Just pick, hand pick some. Psalm 89 verse 14. Psalm 89 verse 14. The Bible says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. See, God is dwelling in justice and judgment. So a false witness that speaketh lies irritates him. That I mean, he inhabits <laughs> where he is is justice and judgment. Proverbs twenty one verse three. The Bible says, "To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice." Justice and judgment. The Bible says in First Kings chapter ten verse nine. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. I mean, you are king, what's your purpose? Judgment and justice. He wants you to judge correctly. He wants justice in the land. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 3, the son is learning from his father. And what does the Bible say? Why are you learning all these words of wisdom? To receive, Proverbs 1 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Right? So God hates a false witness that speaketh lies because you're destroying justice, judgment. You say, oh, but that's to the king. You know, he wants the king to do justice. You're a royal priesthood. You're a king too. You're supposed to judge. Your spiritual mind is supposed to judge. So you're supposed to do judgment. You're supposed to do justice. Remember, open to Acts chapter 6. Remember, lewd fellows of the bay sort. That's a, very, that's a very nice phrase. Hard to forget. You know, just get all these loose fellows. Uh, lewd fellows from, of the base of, just to lie and be false witnesses. People that you can just easily manipulate, maybe even pay them. It's just like, in fact, I don't want to get into politics, but um, uh, that is them, that is a false witness that speak at lies. Oh yes, we saw him do that. Oh yes, I mean, you're a false witness that speak at lies. Even there were false witnesses that spoke lies against Jesus in the middle of the night. I mean, how bad? You know the Bible says they cannot sleep until they do evil. I mean, they catch Jesus in the middle of the night, take him to the, uh, to the uh, high priest, and they are false witnesses, and their witnesses don't even agree. I mean, at that point, shouldn't you just acquit, <laughs> right? I don't get into politics, but at that point, you should just, these witnesses don't agree. This, we can't, let, let him go, he's free. So, but, yeah, there are false witnesses against Jesus Christ. So you can imagine, this is something Jesus really hated. 
You know, in Acts chapter 6, I read from verse 9. Against Stephen, they did the same. The Bible says, Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogues, which is called the synagogue of Satan. I'm just kidding. Synagogue of the Libertines and the uh, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then he suborned, sorry, they suborned men, which said, these men are the false witnesses that speak at lies, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So pause. Uh, or, or stop here. You can see these guys, pure, just saying lies. Obviously, that's not what, um, what's his name, Stephen was saying. Let's go back a little bit to the first one, hands that shed innocent blood. You see, but you see why uh, Paul, probably uh, Saul, probably killed him because this is what Saul thought that they're destroying the law of Moses. Yeah, you know, he was deceived. They had all these false witnesses. So Paul, Saul is like, yeah, yeah, let's kill this guy. Yeah, I'll hold your clothes for you. You know, kill the guy, stone him. It doesn't matter if you are deceived or not, right? Paul, uh, Saul did not want to receive the gospel. He didn't hear a clear presentation, maybe. But he's like, I'm going to kill this guy because he's one of the people following Jesus. He's against. Anyway, that was Paul's case. He was ignorant of the fact. But in, because he didn't know that ignorance, that's why God forgave him. He wasn't reprobate. Um, but these guys, they knew what they were doing. You see, that's a different level on its own. They knew what they were doing and they were lying intentionally. God really hates this. And this usually it starts from childhood. So children, listen carefully. It starts from childhood. You start lying against your siblings. You start lying against other people. You grow up to be a false witness that speak at lies. And it's hard to change when you grow up. So as a child, don't tell lies. Don't lie against your siblings. Don't lie to get out or lie to your parents just to put someone else in trouble so you feel good. It, it, you grow as an adult and it's hard for it to come out of you. But it doesn't mean it doesn't happen to adults. You know, for different reasons, maybe for money or, or for, for different things. Please, let's not be caught in doing things like that. All right, number seven, number seven and the last one. He that soweth discord among brethren. Open to Psalm 133, Psalm 133. So he that soweth discord among brethren, first thing that comes to my mind, false brethren. False brethren, they sow discord amongst brethren. The man of Belial that was with David, remember when David went with his, um, with his men to recover what was stolen or what was taken or his, cap his wives and his goods that were captive. When he recovered them, some couldn't go, so the 200 that came with him, they said, oh, let's not give to those ones that couldn't go, since they didn't work for it, oh. right? It's salvation is by grace. I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> but you can use that, that could apply. But the, the unsaved ones are like, oh, you gotta work for it, you gotta work for it. Anyway, but, so since they didn't fight the battle, the, uh, the sons of Belial, they wanted to sow discord. They're like, no, this one should suffer. So what would, he, what would you do with their, okay, yeah, let's just give them their wives and stuff. All their goods, mine. Like, it doesn't even make sense. So David made that a law and whether you fight, whether you don't fight, you you know you get the spoils too and your stuff. So uh, you have those men, false brethren, and it's quick and easy to point to false brethren that sow discord among brethren. So it's quick and easy, and rightfully so, because false brethren do that. They want to break up the church. They are working for the devil, and they sow discord. But believers also are guilty of this. Believers are guilty of sowing discord among brethren. Remember the Bible, uh, I think it's an act, I didn't put it here, but the Pharisees, the Bible says the Pharisees that believed were demanding that people should be circumcised. The, the Bible says the Pharisees that believed. So they are not false brethren as per they are not unsaved because they believe. But they are ignorant, you know, teaching the law, teaching and you know, they want to be teachers and they don't know whereof they are affirming. Teachers of the law, they don't know what they are affirming or what they are speaking. So they don't understand and they are sowing discord, they are dividing the church, causing uh, problems to happen between brethren. 
So you have brethren turning the hearts of others uh, against the pastor, for instance, because they want to drag people to themselves, right? Um, they, they want to drag uh, 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 sheep to themselves. So they'll turn the heart of other brethren against the pastor or against another brother, or maybe it's for business, or even just for fame, spirituality, their own names. You know, Paul warned about all this. Where do we see this gossiping, backbiting? This is sowing discord among brethren. When you're, got, you're taking information that is none of your business. Right? Oh, Pastor, do you know what I saw her wearing the other day? Hmm. I don't know. Her husband might not be taking care of her or something. Or it's not helping her. It's not doing the right thing. Probably if she's doing this outside, then what are they doing in their house? Yeah, it's not your business. Don't sow discord among brethren. You're there in Psalm 133. It's not long. We'll read the whole thing. The Bible says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended from the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So it's a wonderful thing for brethren to dwell in unity. I mean, I could go into examples of people sowing discord and sowing discord but let's focus on the unity let's focus on the positive part you know god said in philippians chapter 2 that he wants us to be in one accord one mind one purpose amen so let's focus on that because god hates the opposite it's an abomination to him where you have somebody trying to sow discord trying to break up two brethren trying to break up a group or uh, god hates it because two are better than one. And a three chord, uh, chord, threefold chord is not easily broken. All right, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 21. The story of Naboth's vineyard. Um, there's a lot of wrong things in this story. And if I was to break down this story, we'll not, we'll not live here in the right amount of time. So, I don't want to get carried away. I just want to focus on the abominations I talked about. Because you can see all four abominations I talked about. More than that, in fact. But let's just focus on the four abominations. There's just so many things wrong. I mean, Ahab, Saul came back to his room. And his wife is like, you know what, don't worry. Are you not king? Are you not governor of the land? I'll get this for you. Ahab is like, okay, go get it for me. What kind of a man is that? That's effeminate. God hates that. You see? That's what effeminate means. But, as I said, there's so many things wrong with the story, but we'll just focus. So, Jezebel comes up with a cunning plan. Very smart plan. It is smart. The devil is smart. And what do we see? A heart that devised wicked imaginations. How wicked was that? That was a very cunning... I mean, using the word of God against him. I mean, that's what she did. She bribed the elders because I don't think they were just afraid of her words. Maybe they were. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they took her as a god or something. But she brought... Uh, uh, oh, there was corruption. Let me just put it that way. There was corruption in the land because the elders knew what they were doing was wrong. The nobles of the land, they knew what they were doing was wrong. And this is a plan that she cooked up to set up neighbors uh, to kill him. So she abused the word of God. She said, proclaim a fast. That's abusing the word of God. That's coming up with a plan and abusing God's own laws. Proclaim it fast and um, call two witnesses. She didn't say one. Do you see she knows the Bible? She knows the laws of Moses that a man cannot be put to death with one witness. You need two witnesses. So she's manipulating her knowledge of the laws of Moses. She knows what the fast is. She knows what happened. She, and she calls two witnesses. And those two witnesses lied against neighbor, right? What do we see? A false witness that speaketh lies. Two of them, not even one. So that's double. God hates it exponentially too. Because the Bible says one who chase a thousand and two will put ten thousand to flight, right? So there's an exponential mathematics in that. So I'm applying it here. So God really, really hates it because it's exponential. Um, so we, that's the second one we see in this story. So this, uh, the same followed that being, since you're the witness that you witnessed against somebody to put somebody to death, the laws of Moses demand that you are the first one to stone the person. That's what laws of Moses demand. So it follows that they had hands that shed innocent blood. 
because he had the first ones to stone, they joined and they stoned. So they have hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, so we see that uh, according to the laws of Moses, that's why I believe that they fall into that category because you can't say, oh, they didn't kill the person. No, they killed the person because they should have stoned the, the uh, neighbor first. Then these false witnesses were false brethren. And what did they do? They sowed discord among brethren. They sowed, they, they were sons of Belial, the Bible says. They were false brethren, it happened to be that. And they sowed discord among brethren because Naboth was probably looked at as a good guy, a normal guy in the society, and children of Israel. And now you lied against him, and all his brethren turned against him, turned against his family. You know, uh, they killed Naboth. You can imagine everything of Naboth was despised and looked down upon. So his whole family, I mean his whole lean, it, it, it was just bad what they did. And they probably never found out <laughs> because uh, we were reading it for our own knowledge, for our own use. It's not like they went back and they read it and they're like, oh yeah, we did something wrong. God said it was wrong. That these were false brothers. No. So all these were more than enough reasons for the judgment of God to come down. You can see four of these things. One of these things alone, God hates it so much. But all these were enough for the judgment of God to come down upon the house of Ahab. So, notice from all these things that you hurt other people when you're doing these things. You know, a proud look, you're hurting people. Uh, false witnesses, you're hurting people. Shedding innocent blood. I mean, that just, you're hurting people. All of them, you're hurting people. See, a proud look might not look harmful. You say, oh yeah, it's a proud look. How am I hurting anybody? It might not look harmful, but it might be the most dangerous of them all. A proud look. Because it's mentioned first for a reason. Number one. It's mentioned first. But from pride, that leads to various, you don't even know what it's going to lead to. I mean, look at the devil that walked with the Lord and pride. Iniquity was found in him. And that was pride. And look at what it has led to. I mean, he is the devil now. This is someone that, you don't think when he was created, oh, it was just evil. Like, no, it was, it was perfect. That's what the Bible says. And just pride entered. Proud look, when it overflows in your heart, it can lead to anything. You know, envy, you want to pull people down, you can shed innocent blood just because of pride. Oh, I want to be the best in this, I want, I, I want people to look at me. It can lead to anything, so it could be the most harmful of them all. Maybe, it, it, <laughs> there's a reason why I mentioned first, that's why, I, that's why I want to tell you, because when God says, I hate seven things, or six things, seven abomination unto me, hey, proud look. First thing God mentions. So all these things, they hurt people, and God does not like that. Notice believers are also guilty of all these things. There's not one of them. You say, oh, this one doesn't apply to believers. It applies to all, all of them apply to believers. And that's why God warns us. Open to Galatians chapter 5. God warns us about the flesh that is housing us. About this temple, this vessel that you have. He warns us specifically about the flesh for believers. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 14, the Bible says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, God is very concerned about others, hurting others. Verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what's the Bible saying? Walk in the spirit. Because if he's saying, oh, you, there's no way you sin. Once you're saved, uh, you cannot sin anymore. Or you shouldn't be living in sin. And once you're living in sin, you should go back and get saved. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you could be saved and you still be doing all these things of the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit. So God is warning us about that. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Say, oh, I don't want to be an abomination to the Lord. I don't want God to be so angry me but your flesh wants to do that so the flesh is working against the spirit so don't let pride overcome you amen don't be a false witness don't shed innocent blood says but uh where am i verse 18 but if ye be led of the spirit ye are not under the law so how are you led of the spirit you go look for the holy spirit and say holy spirit lead me what am i going to wear today no i'm just kidding that's not how to be led of the spirit let us read by following the word of God. Have the word of, let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. 
right so the led of the spirit uh, what does God want me to do the will of God is written in the Bible all your moves your next step hey come into the hands of God and God order your steps amen Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emul emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, right? I mean, I'm just adding another verse, <laughs> First Corinthians. <laughs> All right. So, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are purified, right? That's what the Bible says. So, we were like this before, or we, uh, yeah, we're like this before, at least some of it says, and such like. So, things like this. But we should not be like that. It, God is wanting us, don't let the flesh rule in your life. Don't bend and submit to the flesh. Instead, continue to be led by the Spirit of God, continue to die daily. It's a daily thing. Don't say, oh, I, I've already overcome it. So, uh, I will overcome pride. I, you know, once I, when I got saved, you know, I had to humble myself. <laughs> I used to be a Pentecostal. I used to be this. I used to be that. But I got saved. I humble myself. Uh, me and humility, you know, I'm the most humble person you find out there. Ah, uh, you can you can quote that. You know, that is pride. <laughs> you're so humble that you're full of pride. <laughs> You know, so don't say, Oh, I've overcome this. Oh, there's no way I'll share the innocent blood. Ah, be careful, examine yourself daily, die to the flesh daily. Amen. Open to Psalm 24, I'll end there. Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Because we want to establish ourselves in the Lord, right? We want to, we want to be led by the Spirit of God. Uh, we want God to be pleased with us. And we don't want to be an abomination to the Lord. And this is what the Bible says in verse 3, Psalm 24. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So God is giving you all this. He says, you want to ascend the hill of God. You want to walk by God. You want to be under the shadow of the Almighty, right? You want to stay with God in this place. Hey, pure hands, right? Uh, pure hearts, clean hands, pure hearts. You've not lifted up your soul to vanity. You're not, you don't care about the things of this world. All the things in this world, vanity of vanity, said the preacher, all is vanity. You know, you've not sworn deceitfully. You're not lying. You're not, I mean, Bible says no even swear, period. No more swearing. So, then you ascend to the hill of the Lord. Then you, you get the, the, the treasures of darkness, as the Bible calls it. You God uh, show, reveal himself more and more to you. So that's where we want to be. We don't want to be where we are abominations, or God looks at us as an abomination, or our works as an abomination, the things that we do. And when God hates it, his anger comes down. You cannot quench it anymore, like happened to Judah. No matter how good you are, after you've done this abomination, oh, you're so good, you do the best. Uh, sacrifice the best you know walk for God you sacrifice yourself all of that yeah. that destruction is coming that's who God is God hates these abominations all right let's bow our heads again father we thank you for your word thank you for teaching us to open our eyes to these things helping us to understand things that you do not like not just that you don't like that you dislike not just that you dislike that you hate not just that you hate but that are abominations unto you things that are disgusting things that you abhor i pray oh lord that we would you help us not to fall into one of these things into one of these sins hey let us never get even close to this help us oh lord to continue to show love to our brethren to love one another hey it is the law summarized love your your neighbor as yourself so help us to love our neighbors as ourselves help us to die to the flesh daily so that we can be pleasing unto you so that you can bless us so that um, you can use us so oh Lord thank you father for your word thank you for this church thank you for what you're doing in our lives thank you oh Lord for everything we ask oh Lord as we go you protect us you be with us Continue to give us good health there's a scare of this coronavirus out there I pray oh Lord that um, you just keep us safe 
we want to work for you. We, we want to have a good life, a quiet, peaceable life here on earth. Just keep us safe from all this. Uh, we're not going to walk in fear. Um, and those that are going through it, Daddy, help them according to your will, O oh Lord. And um, I pray, O oh Lord, that next time we meet, we'll be to your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.